Okay, great to have you here. Uh, I think we've already landed on something. Did anyone get hurt? <laughs> what? One time I jumped off my bed and I landed on my dog. He didn't get hurt, but he wasn't very happy. I like watching airplanes land. Okay, I, I think I see where this is going, but let's try to focus. I wish my staff listened to this closely. So last week we, we landed on a great idea without any dogs getting hurt in the process. I, I think we need to think about how to love God. Oh, I love God. I love God too. Oh, I love God more than they do. Let, 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 let's not go there. <laughs> it's just super simple to love God. It is? You just do whatever he asks. It's not hard. And we should just listen to what he tells us to do? Yeah, he is God. Duh. Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. Great to have you here. Great to have those joining us at Crossroads and Highland Park and upstairs. And great to have those of you, yes, fleeing Irma that are joining us. We'll be down to visit in about five or six months when the weather is uh, different up here and you've cleaned up. Um, so so uh, I have here uh, an exquisite piece of art that I bought. 30 years ago, we were newly married, very poor, living in a small apartment, furnishing it from garage sales here and there. We had a little fireplace, and I thought this would look nice over the fireplace. I paid 50 cents for this. Not everyone in our family thought that was a good deal. <laughs> and so uh, after just a few days of living over the fireplace, this, uh, this ship was, um, well, it went into storage. I had to fight to get it into storage as opposed to the garbage can, and it hasn't seen the light of day in uh, 30 years. But imagine my joy when, uh, after lots of conversations about my judgment, when we found this exact ship on sale in an art shop, uh, one of the San Juan Islands, for $300, which was 600 times what I had paid for it. I figured out the return on investment, and it was like 60,000%. And uh, so I was glad to have what I established as an uh, independent market analysis of my judgment. And... Uh, I would routinely go back to the fact that the only time the marketplace has been able to weigh in on my judgment, it would prove to be very uh, astute. We don't always understand the value of the things that we have. Let me tell you another story I, I read about this summer. There was, a, uh, there was a woman who, towards the end of her life, was, was passing on some of the things that were dear to her, some of the family heirlooms. And, there was a particular piece of jewelry that, that she had never worn. She didn't like it. Uh, it had been in her family, and uh, she decided to include it in a list of things that she was taking to get an independent appraisal of it. And she was shocked when uh, the jeweler called back and said that, uh, you know, the value of that particular piece was multi millions of dollars. It was the most exquisite piece of jewelry he had ever in his long career been privileged to hold. It was worth more than everything he had in his store, and it was worth multiple millions of dollars. She was floored, and then she was very angry because she had lived her life without ever appreciating the value of something that she had. <laughs> She had not lived a life that had reflected this value. I would like to suggest to you that many people live a life without appreciating the value of something that has been offered to them. And that is a relationship with God. Right, The creator of all things everywhere delights in you, loves you, and welcomes a relationship with you, one that changes things now and on into eternity. But many people don't lean into that. 
So this is the second week in this series called Discovering Life with God, and we are, um, we are trying to figure out what that means. Last week, I did a quick flyover of the book of Ecclesiastes and noted that it was a complicated book to understand, that uh, King Solomon sort of plays the role of a philosophy professor, uses a Socratic method to sort of rub our noses in the fact that the three most common approaches uh, to life, humanism, which is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be remembered by being a good person, hedonism, which is I am going to eat, drink, and be merry and seek all the pleasure I can while I can, and existentialism, which is that life doesn't really have ultimate meaning, but I'm going to act like it does, that uh, he dismantles all three of these. He shows that uh, they don't withstand the, uh, the reality of death, and that he, he played them out uh, at the highest level because he was the king, because he was wise, because he had all access to all this money, all the, the, the wine, the women. He had access to everything. He pursued all of these at a huge level, and they had, they had pro- proven to not work. And so it looks as though there is no value to life, but then at the very last of Ecclesiastes, he pivots and he says, so here's the way life can have meaning. <laughs> you live with God. You seek God. Your life, your values, your approach is shaped by the reality of God and the reality that there can be life after death. Uh, and so this is what changes everything. And then from there we jump to the Gospel of John and, and noted that uh, John sort of has this thunderous opening where he, uh, he breaks the, the silence and the pessimism of the Greek philosophers who no longer believe that life has purpose, that they can figure out a purpose for man. Uh, and he says, in the beginning was purpose, right? In the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was the logic. In the beginning was the all unifying uh, idea. And it wasn't just an idea, it was a person. It was Jesus. And, and that John is arguing, as the New Testament is arguing, as the Bible is arguing, that we were made for God, we were made by God and for God, we are completed in a relationship with God, and that this comes through Jesus Christ, God's Son the Savior of the world. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is to think about what it looks like to love God. So we're, we're, this series is sort of going to pivot on, on three little phrases. So we're talking about how to discover life with God, and the argument is that we need to love God, serve others, and reach one. And so today I want to talk about what it looks like to love God. In this Moment, right in this postmodern, post truth, alternative news, uh, in a world where more people watch cat videos than read serious books, in a, in a moment where we are again faced with uh, sort of real uh, ugly racial anger and, and confusion, in a moment where there are again uh, unstable states with nuclear powers. Uh, in this moment of hurricanes and earthquakes, what does it look like to love God? So there are different paths we could head down. There are a number of chapters in the Bible that are particularly focused on love. So uh, we could, for instance, we could uh, look at 1 Corinthians 13 or 1 John 4. We could look at some of the different nuances of the Greek terms for love. There's phileo, eros, agape, and others. I've, I've done that in the past. Uh, we could look at some of the uh, scripts, for lack of a better term, some of, the, some of the pathways that get laid out for us about the things that we should do. I, I think there's great value in that. We're, we're 2,000 years into uh, uh, the, the faith. There are people that have learned some things before us about how to do this and how to make this work. Uh, and we'll be doing that a little bit later on. I'm, I'm always nervous when we think about that because any sort of set of rules can become a legalistic, self-righteous justification exercise in pride. So we've always got to be careful of that. I want to do something a little different today. I want us to think about what it looks like to worship God. And the premise is that... Uh, to love God is to worship God, 
and to worship God is to love God. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're very close. And so if we were to think a little bit more about worship, we might understand a little bit better about what it looks like to love God. So I just have a, I have a half dozen observations about worshiping God and about worship. And uh, I want to set those in front of you for you to wrestle with, talk about in your small groups, think about in terms of your own life. So I want to start, uh, my first point is just a, a simple definition of worship. Uh, worship is our natural response to something that's awesome. So when we're in the presence of something that's amazing, we're amazed. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, and when we're, when we're with other people who share our amazement, that tends to lead us down a pathway of worship. And one of the places to see this is with sports. When people ask me, for the last few years, when people ask me, what's the biggest church uh, in Chicago? I say, Soldier Field, every Sunday during the fall, right? Tens of thousands of worshipers are there, right? And, and you see people who, who get excited, who jump up and down, who high-five each other, who break out into song, right? Bear down Chicago Bears, right? They are, they are, they are, they are into it in a, in a very spontaneous sort of euphoric way. And their week often pivots around the, the results of that game and, and anticipation of the next one. And so they wear certain kinds of jerseys and they, and they read scouting reports and uh, there are certain parties that you go to and certain foods that get associated with this. I mean, there's a whole liturgy of, you know, worshiping a, a sports team. And it's not just sports teams. Right? When we're in the presence of anything that is amazing, and sometimes we have to be educated, we have to know enough to be amazed, but we're in the presence of great art or great music or somebody who's just ex unbelievably exceptional in something, we are amazed, right? And, and, and we don't have to be told to be amazed. We're amazed. Amazing things lead us to be amazed. Worship is the natural response to something awesome. The second point is that we are wired to worship. You and I are wired to worship. We, we do it naturally. Uh, in the first Harry Potter novel, Harry uh, discovers the mirror of Erised, which is, if you didn't pick up when you were reading the book, Erised is desire spelled backwards. And when he looks into this mirror, he sees his parents who are expressing their love for him. Harry was an orphan. His parents died saving him when he was a young child. He didn't know them. And, and, and so he's so taken by an opportunity to see his parents and for them to express their love and approval of him. He's just euphoric. So he runs to get Ron, his friend. And when Ron comes and looks in the mirror, what Ron sees is Ron as, as, a, as, as, as a prefect, sort of one of the leaders in the school, and as a great athlete, Quidditch player. So that's what Ron sees. And they're confused about this because they're like, no, it's my parents. And Ron goes, no, it's me. And, and Dumbledore has to explain that this mirror shows what we most want that everyone has some great desire that is sort of animating them. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a sense in which that's what it means to be human, right? We love, we worship, we seek purpose. We organize our, our life around certain things that we think are going to bring us joy, right? We're different than animals. So there's another book that makes this point in a little bit different way. Um, this summer I read, um, I mean, I'm not recommending, it, it, I, I don't agree with a lot of the book, but I read uh, this book by um, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, an Israeli thinker and an atheist, and he wrote a book called Sapiens, A Brief History of Mankind. And uh, what I, what I was reminded of as I'm reading this, because he's talking about all the different um, species that are part of the genus Homo, right? There was Homo sapien and Homo erectus, all these different these species. And what I was reminded of was 
that there was an argument that was made 100, 150 years ago that we should be called homo religious. Because what makes us different from the animals is that we are religious. We worship. We seek meaning. We seek purpose. And so I would just set out to you that uh, worship is, the, is the, our natural response to things that are amazing. And secondly, we're wired to worship. Which leads to the third point. The Bible doesn't ever tell us to worship. It tells us to worship God. <laughs> so it knows that we're going to worship. Right? And, and that's the way it gets framed. The first commandment says, you, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me right, in my sight. Right? Don't worship other things. And there's a, a, a strong argument can be made that the, uh, the, the biggest theme in the Old Testament is the prohibition against idolatry, which is worshiping things that are good but shouldn't be worshipped. Because by and large, what we worship, we don't worship, you know, stone statues today, but we worship things that are good that we just promote to too high a degree. We worship our family, kids, we worship we worship a job or power or pleasure or food or sex or money. These are not inherently bad things, but they can easily be promoted beyond their right station. And so that becomes idolatry. So the Bible has a lot of prohibitions against idolatry because what, we're, what we find in the Bible is not advice to worship. We will worship. What we find in the Bible is counsel to worship God. Which leads to the fourth point. Perhaps the principal reason we get told to worship God is because what we worship shapes us. Please understand, we are not told to worship God because God needs our worship. He does not. In uh, his commentary on the Psalms, C.S. Lewis says that he was Early on, before he came to faith and, and shortly after he came to faith, he was very put off by the Psalms because there's all this instruction to worship God. And he thought that that made God look really small. Like, you know, if somebody tells you that you've got to honor them, that you've got to worship them, that you've got to praise them, that's not generally a very healthy person, right? And so you think less of that person. And then he came to understand God is perfect. God is complete. God has always existed in the perfect fellowship of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's, it's the perfect relationship. It's the perfect environment of love. God doesn't profit from our worship or praise. Lewis said, God needs my praise like I need my dog barking approval of my books. Right? Just, just, that's just not the way it's going to work. But... We need to worship God. We're going to worship something. And if we worship money, it will bend us and shape our soul in a certain direction. If we worship pleasure, it will shape us in a certain direction. If we worship power, right? Whatever we worship, we are going to be molded by that thing that we love. We become like the things that we love. And God who loves us, who loves you, doesn't want to see you molded by this rabid pursuit of power. Right? That's not good for our soul. We were made by God, we were made for God, and we only find the kind of lasting joy we are after in a relationship with God. And so we are instructed by God for our benefit to worship God. So, what do you worship? I mean, what, what, what would the, the dispassionate, objective, outside, third-party observer say if they spent a week with you? If they looked at how you spent your time, if they looked at how you spent your money, if they looked at, you know, what you thought about, they had access to that, what would they say you worshiped? Right? That's sort of the question of the hour. It leads us to point five. Uh, what we find in the Bible 
is instruction to focus on God. So in Psalm 95, we read, um, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. So this is, this is in an imperative case. So this is a command. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. I could go on. Psalm 100. It is, it's just sort of uh, everywhere once you start to look for it. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the land. Exclamation point. Again, it's a, it's a command. It's in the imperative case. We're being ordered. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Come into his presence with singing. Right? We're being instructed to focus on God. Because... God is amazing. And when we come into his presence, when we focus on God, when we read about God, when we reflect, when we pray, when we meditate, when we, when we go through the spiritual practices and we get a, a fuller understanding of who God is, that leads us, that focus leads us to worship. And that worship shapes us in the ways that we need to be shaped. So what we find throughout the Bible is instruction to focus on God, to build into our life a cadence of things, small group gatherings, daily readings, times of prayer. I mean, there's just, there's just none of these things are, are mysterious. The fact that they work is not all that mysterious. The challenge is we just don't, we don't generally do them. But what we're being told, what we're being coached to do is to figure out a cadence of life where we have reasons to focus on God. Because if we will focus on God, then we will worship. And worship will pull us and shape us in the right direction. And the last point I'll make is that this includes focusing on God when everything is going wrong. So I want to read uh, a, a story out of 2 Samuel 6. And in order to appreciate what happens in 2 Samuel 6, you have to understand what happens in 2 Samuel 5. So in 2 Samuel 5, David has this unbelievable string of events. So for the longest time, Saul has been trying to kill him. He was sort of the king designate. Saul's been trying to kill him. In 2 Samuel 5, Saul dies. So David is appointed to be the king. Then he, he somehow secures uh, Jerusalem to be the capital. It's, it is the right place for a, a capital. It's at the top of this mountain. I mean, it will, it will remain the, the city for 3,000 years. I mean, it's... it's it is a strategic place. He secures Jerusalem as the capital. And the last thing that he does is um, he defeats the Philistines, or sort of their arch enemy. So to put this in 21st century terms, right, the board has just fired the CEO who was trying to get you fired and made you CEO. You somehow managed to secure Apple's new space station headquarters to be the corporate offices for your company. And you, you win a lawsuit against one of your corporate rivals, who, a patent infringement, and the court says, yes, absolutely, they stole, they stole uh, your intellectual property. They owe you $7 billion, and they go out of business. I mean, it's just like everything is going right for David. So some of you have had a Chapter 5 week or arguably a chapter five month or year. Lots of things have gone right. right. And you know, if that's the case, that it's pretty easy to be thankful to God for all the things that are happening. So it wouldn't surprise you if I said that in, in chapter six, David decides to have a big celebration, a worship event. And he gets... All, the, all the, the country, 30,000 people to form a parade of singing and dancing. And he's at the front of the parade. 
dancing his heart out, leading the people to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, the capital. So the Ark of the Covenant, if you didn't see Raiders of the Lost Ark and you're sort of clueless about the Ark of the Covenant, right, it was like the, the most holy of holy relics uh, in the Old Testament. It was, it was, a, it was an, a box and it was overlaid with gold and there were two angels uh, with wings outstretched and some of the, some of the most precious things of all time were were inside of it, but even more than that, it, it was understood that this, and it, it was to be in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle later in the temple, this was the place where God manifested his presence. God is everywhere, but God would manifest his presence in particular at, at the Ark of the Covenant. And so the Jews used to um, parade it around to sort of say, we've got the Ark, we're better than you are, and when they go into battle, they'd always bring it out as a good luck charm, and then one time uh, the Philistines captured it, uh, and they took it back to their uh, temple, but uh, it, it kept knocking down all the idols. In the middle of the night, all the idols that the, uh, the Philistines had would be broken and busted, and so after a couple days, they said, we don't actually want this thing, so they put it on a cart, and they shipped it back towards Israel, and it lands in this field, and it's just been there, and now David is going to get the Ark of the Covenant and to bring it into Jerusalem. Big parade, big party. I'm reading now 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. So they've put the ark of the covenant onto a cart, and they are, they are transporting it into, uh, into Jerusalem. Now, you're not supposed to actually put the ark of the covenant on a cart. There were real explicit instructions about how you dealt with the Ark of the Covenant. It had rings on all four corners. You put long poles between them. There was a whole cast of Levitical priests whose job was to transport the Ark. And, and you were never supposed to touch it. Okay? But it's about to fall off of the Ark into the mud. And so Uzzah put out his hand um, and hand of the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Verse 7, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him dead there. And David was angry because, really puts a damper on the whole worship service. And uh, this is the kind of thing that gives the Old Testament a really bad reputation. Like, really, God, there's a big worship party, and you strike this guy dead because he touches the ark. He's keeping it from falling into the mud. Right? Now, this is, this is not to the point I want to make, so let me just say, there's nothing wrong with mud, right? Mud is not sinful, right? Mud is just mud. Mud's fine. Uh, so mud can touch the ark. It's sinful people that can't touch the ark. And the point I would like you to get from this particular instance here is that sometimes... Worshiping God isn't convenient. It wasn't convenient for David to do this the right way. He's like, yeah, let's not bother with the whole, you know, getting these, these people here and getting the poles and everything. Let's just put it on a cart. There's a lot of times where worship is not convenient. But uh, we have to remember who God is and who God isn't. So the point here, and I, and I jump down, um, to, to verse 12, what happens is David, after, after Uzzah dies, David says, that's it, party's over, worship service ends early, everybody go back home. He says, leave the ark here. And so the ark at this point is at the home of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And so they just leave it, they leave the ark, and David goes back to Jerusalem. And after about three months, uh, his advisors come to him and they say, David, Obed-Edom has had like one chapter 5 day after the next. Everything is going right for Obed-Edom. We got to go get that ark, and we got to get it into Jerusalem. And uh, so David goes back, and you read um, in verse 12 that, that they go back, and they transport the ark the correct way, and they, they offer lots of sacrifices. Every six steps, they stop and have a sacrifice, which is sort of, when you're sacrificing bulls, that's that you're 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 giving money, right? You're sort of that was part of the currency. That's how people carried wealth, and so it was an act of of, uh, of worship and an act of sacrifice. Here's the point. David 
worships God after a chapter six week also. So he worshiped God after chapter five when everything was going right. It was just like he wanted. He was, he throws a party. But he also throws a party after a chapter six week as well. We need to focus on God and worship God when things are going well and when they're not. I want to show you um, a brief video here of someone from our congregation who is looking to lean in and focus on God and appreciate God and worship God in the midst of a chapter six week. Let's play this video. My name is Bill Hartman. I'm a Christ follower. Christ Church has been a very integral part of my life. I grew up uh, in a Christian household, but I'm going to put quotes around the Christian aspect of it. We followed the basics. We uh, talked about it somewhat, but not as I do with my two daughters. Didn't really embrace the Great Commission, for instance, as I, uh, as I do today. It really uh, came in, in full force for me after I got diagnosed with uh, the brain cancer. Um, I began living in a little different way. I have a condition called glioblastoma. It's a, a deadly form of brain cancer that has a propensity to return. I was on a clinical trial that went bankrupt, so I was then off of it. It was immunotherapy, which I gave a lot of hope into. So right now I'm just staying on uh, my normal uh, new regimen, which I like. It's a daily chemo. Um, I like the gentler, softer, daily regimen because A, it's different, and under the old way, it, it came back. So I had my second uh, uh, brain surgery a week and a half ago. Health issues and, and just growing within the church has given me my life, peace, comfort, uh, a way of, of living in, in a much more structured way. Uh, I feel that there's two deep loves. There's a love of self and love of others, which uh, can be even stronger. Well, if you don't have it, you can't give it away. You, you, if you've never experienced it. It usually starts with service, and that's to work and to help others. I think it's those kinds of experiences that brings people so close to that, that pure love of God in their heart. And when they have it, they never want to let it go. And you just want to keep it, maintain it in every way you can. So coming from a cultural Christian um, to where I am today has been a really powerful move where I feel like I'm at least you know, facing the Great Commission on what Christ followers are, are called to do. I realized that I was waking up every morning just feeling great and uh, regardless of the chemo, radiation, surgery, um, and um, I realized it was because of my, my three main community groups, my church, my small group, my uh, family, my friends, really the community of this church is something I look forward to throughout the week. And that's the truth. Because <laughs> it's, it's powerful when I think about how this church has, has, has so impacted my life and really got me on a, on a, on a really good course. Uh, the way forward to the life that you want is found in God. We need to worship God. Right? Not for his sake, but for ours. This means that we need to focus on God. You are responsible for focusing on God. You lead you. <laughs> so you need to figure out how to get this done. And I would say, you know, pick a service and make it a priority. I would say uh, get into a group that is going to help hold you accountable. I would say, you know, develop some daily practices. Find places to serve. You lead your life. You will be shaped by something. If you focus on God, God is amazing enough that you will 
you will be shaped by him, by his grace, by his mercy, by his goodness, by his love, by his holiness. And that's the way forward. Let me pray for us. Lord God, uh, there are lots of us here who have enjoyed lots of chapter five weeks. There are plenty of us here who've had some decimating chapter six experiences. Help us, uh, whether we're in the midst of a chapter five or a chapter six or something in between, to, um, to know you more. And not just to know about you, but to know you and to be shaped by you, to be molded by you, to come uh, and sort of get caught up into the current of praise around you, to see you for who you are, and to be um, filled with the hope and the joy and the peace that comes out of that and to be shaped in ways that please you. Guide us to that end. In Christ's name.